This is a conversation that to me caps off one of the most fascinating periods of Fed history and economic history that I've ever seen. Rich Clarida, former Fed vice chair, as well as Columbia University professor and PIMCO global economic advisor, as well as renowned singer. Uh, Rich Clarida, thank you so much for being here hey, Lisa. in person. I just want to start with what you make of the past week, Fed Chair Powell's comments and the market's reaction. Well, uh, the chair's comments took me by surprise. Uh, and. Um, uh, he had a he had a, a difficult mission because it's the last meeting of the year. It's natural to look ahead, um, but yes, I thought both the press conference and the FOMC statement were were more dovish than I uh, expected. You know, there is a soft landing base case. We're all hoping for it, um, and I think the markets are really focused uh, on that. He didn't say mission accomplished. I'm not sure if he thinks mission accomplished, but that's being interpreted uh, that uh, way. And of course, as you've mentioned on air, we've had a little bit of pushback. Uh, recently, uh, so we're all now trying to assess, you know, what message they would like to deliver. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to ask yeah. you. What do you make of the pushback? Well, I think the delicate challenge, and we've discussed this on the show in the past, is a tug of war between their guidance and market pricing. You know, part of the reason Lisa inflation is expected to come down next year to two point something uh, is because financial conditions have tightened. Uh, well, as the markets think mission accomplished and rate cuts, six cuts are, are coming in next year, that will ease conditions. That makes it less likely that inflation comes down. So it's a tri tricky point right now for the Fed. Do you think that Fed Chair Powell made a mistake? I don't think so. I think, I think he was reflecting uh, his committee, um, and I think in the press conference, sometimes chairs can sort of distance themselves, and I think he was embracing the baseline view, but there is a risk case as well, and I think perhaps the, some of the pushback is to remind folks about those other scenarios. Mary Daly, in, in a yeah. Wall Street Journal uh, discussion yesterday, came out and said even if the Fed cuts rates by three times next year, that the Fed's benchmark rate will still be quite restrictive, even if in that scenario. And then she wanted to say we have, uh, we have to be forward looking and make sure that we don't give people price stability, but take away jobs. Is this a new emphasis for the Fed? Well, Lisa, I think at the margin it is because I think inflation was so high for so long, I think the Fed effectively had a single mandate for a couple of years. <clears throat> we got to get inflation lower. The Fed, of course, has a dual uh, mandate, uh, but I, I do think, and I, of course, work closely with Mary, I'm a big fan of hers. I do think the issue is here is that the committee itself emphasizes financial conditions. Indeed, financial conditions made an appearance in the November statement and reappeared in December. It is true uh, that one element is the real funds rate, but other financial conditions are easing, which, as we said, makes it less likely that inflation does come down. Which uh, raises this question about whether you are right. The two-point-something kind of view of inflation is kind of what the Fed is embracing right now in order not to jeopardize the labor market. Is that what your sense is? Well, I've always thought uh, that two point something would be the point at which they start to think about cutting. So that is playing out in, the, in their uh, uh, projection. I do believe down to the individual, there are 19 of them. They all want inflation to get to two. Um, and I do agree with them that if they hold off cutting rates at all until inflation gets to two, they're, they're probably going to, to overshoot. Um, but the timing is delicate. Um, and I think there is a, you know, there is a risk case on both uh, sides. Uh, but I do think they are emphasizing now the, the dual mandate more than they have been. Do you think it's because they're seeing something that other people aren't, or they're at least emphasizing in their own data some of the weakness that maybe is overlooked by people who are piling into the market? I'm not really sure of that. I think it's important for them, you know, the Fed was, was criticized a lot in 2021 and 2022 for being behind the curve. I think it's appropriate to step back and acknowledge the progress in disinflation. Um, and I think they're seeing that, but I think there's still still a ways to go. Um, and I think in particular, the labor market may require more adjustment than they're <clears throat> factoring in. Sorry. <clears throat> no, it's all right. I'll let no. you catch your breath. No. Uh, it's, it's a confusing moment for no. all of us. <laughs> and I'm wondering if you think it helps or hurts the cause to see the Fed come out, Fed Chair Jay Powell with one message, and then Austin Goolsby saying, you guys, I'm surprised by your reaction, and hearing from John Williams saying, we're not really talking about rate cuts. I, that's you know that's not that's not something you, you'd like to see coming out of a of a meeting. Um, I I think the market reaction 
easing financial conditions uh, is something that they are trying to push back against. I don't know how successful they, they, they can be, however. Do you think that easing in financial conditions does have ultimately an inflationary impact right now? Well, to the to the to the same extent that if you tighten financial conditions, it lowers inflation. If they're if they're eased on a sustainable basis, credit spreads are tight, borrowing costs are lower, valuations are up. At the margin, it supports demand. And if you think there's a demand piece to inflation, then yes. So right now, do you think that it is potentially concerning and counter to what the Fed is looking for, given the all-in feeling? And frankly, I mean, we just heard this morning, the Fed shot the bears. The Fed <laughs> wants to make people happy. I was bearish, but now I'm really bullish. I mean, is this a positive thing? <laughs> Well, I, look, I, I'm very convinced that the Powell Fed will do what it takes. I, I, I think that the communications challenges, which, which were substantial in 2023, may be even more substantial in, in, in 2024. There's been speculation from a number of guests that there is a political element to this, that the calendar is tricky yeah. for the Federal Reserve, considering that heading into November, everything is going to be really politicized. Yeah. Do you buy any of that argument that that would encourage them to make a move earlier in the year? Look, the history history shows, in fact, I checked before I came on air, the Fed has actually adjusted rates in most presidential election years. In fact, they cut rates in 92 and cut rates in 08, although for other reasons, and they've hiked rates as well in election years. So historically, the Fed doesn't let the political calendar dictate the outcome. At the margin, could it influence timing, say, between a June move and a September move? You know, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that the number of rate adjustments we get next year will be the adjustments that that, that the committee thinks is appropriate given the economy. Given that we are talking about the politicization, do you think that this jeopardizes some of the credibility of the Fed, given that so many people have come on here and speculated? Yeah. And we don't have any ability to basically uh, know or not know, but is there some other consequence of just that speculation? I I really don't think so, Lisa. In the end, the Fed will be judged by returning to price stability and ideally doing so at minimal cost to the labor market. And so I think the Fed's credibility in the end will rise and fall with delivering price stability. When you talk about the potential for a reacceleration of inflation and a stickiness, do you see that coming through the services sector in a material way? Which areas of the economy could we yeah. see a more material reignition? Yeah. So. I think I think exactly. So I think goods goods prices are now falling. So we've had goods disinflation, deflation. The service sector typically lags behind. I would also say I think the real where the rubber will hit the road, Lisa, is in the labor market. So we've had a substantial adjustment in the labor market without any rise in unemployment, and that is great. I will say, my good friend and former colleague Chris Waller uh, nailed that back in the summer of 2022. So that's wonderful. I do think, however, that you cannot have 2% price inflation target if wages are going up 4 or 5%, which is where we are now. So I think I would be, if I were there, I'd be looking at the labor market adjustment as well as the services uh, sector uh, as well. You know, one of the measures, which is core services X housing, has basically not adjusted at all in the last uh, several months, so still elevated. A lot of people are talking about how the economic data has been really positive and how the Fed has been doing a good job yeah. and how uh, we have seen unemployment stay low even with inflation. Yeah. coming down. Why do you think people feel so bad? Well, I think there's a distinction, um, and it's certainly one I've thought about and, and written about. Um, economists tend to focus on inflation. That's the change in prices. But individuals in the economy tend to think about the level of prices. So even if inflation returns to 2%, the level of things, going to the grocery store, going to the movies, uh, you know, rent on your apartment, those numbers are all, you know, a lot higher than they were four, four years ago. So I think when inflation's low and stable, we tend to ignore that. But when you've had a big move in the level of prices, I think it does create uh, more uh, concern among households than you may infer just by looking at the inflation data. Oh. I want to ask you, though, also about the housing market. Yeah. You mentioned rents being higher. Yeah. We just got housing starts and building permits yeah. come in higher than expected. We do see some of the uh, Treasury rally pair back, which is uh, what you would expect. Does the high price of homes, in addition to the lack of any volumes, also create some sort of real dampening effect to sentiment? Uh, well, 
I think the high valuation for homes obviously makes the people who own homes happier, but there's a distributional consequence, especially for younger parts of the, of the population, folks in their 20s and 30s who have not yet acquired that first home. And whatever they thought about the cost of ownership three or four years ago, it's a lot higher. But there's a huge wealth effect, positive wealth effect for folks who own homes. Presumably, they're happy about that. Well, but it raises this question yeah. about what this does longer term yeah. to the inflation dynamic, but also to sentiment, particularly for younger yeah. individuals who haven't gotten in. Yeah, well, it, it does. And I think that um, this is an unusual period, Lisa, in the sense that uh, because so many folks refinanced into low rate mortgages in the prior decade, uh, the Fed, including when I was there, it was doing QE to, to support the, the mortgage uh, market. And because these are 15 and 30 year fixed rate mortgages, it is having this effect on supply that may be with us for a while. We're, uh, we're here with Richard Clarida of PIMCO, formerly uh, Fed Vice Chair. We are going to be having a conversation with my colleague David Weston, with Brian Moynihan of Bank of America. And I do want to get your take, uh, Rich, on whether you are seeing the stability in banks as one reason why a soft landing can materialize, right? Oh, yeah. Is that sort of one tailwind, tailwind uh, that to a lot of this rally that was not there, say, in March? Lisa, absolutely. You know, the global financial crisis triggered a, a major rethink of the way that we uh, regulate and supervise banks in the U.S. As a whole, if you look at all the banks, they have lots of capital, lots of liquidity. Um, and indeed, in 2020, when we were going through the dark days of the pandemic, you know, banks were a source of stability and increasing lending. So absolutely, I, I do think it's an important reason uh, to, th to think of the banking system as supporting uh, the, the economy and not being a headwind. Rich Clarida, thank you so much for taking the time, as always. You, Wonderful Lisa. to get your insights.